es de mañana en Mar del Plata. Un equipo de biólogos y geólogos de la universidad sale a una jornada de trabajo de campo. El destino, la Laguna Nahuel Rucá. Ubicada en el partido de Mar Chiquita, al sudeste de la provincia de Buenos Aires, es una de las 200.000 lagunas que salpican la llanura bonaerense. Como un gran archivo a cielo abierto, esta laguna guarda entre sus sedimentos la historia ambiental de la región. Cuando nosotros hincamos un tubo, por ejemplo, y sacamos dos, tres metros de sedimento, tenemos ahí más o menos eh, la historia de los últimos 3.000, 4.000 años, más o menos, en, esta, en estos cuerpos de agua. Y a veces se han sacado testigos de mucha más longitud que han llegado hasta los 10.000 años en estos cuerpos de agua. No, mira qué lindo testigo. Eh, hermoso. El objetivo de estudiar las lagunas es tratar de entender cómo fueron estos sistemas en el pasado. Entendiendo por el pasado los últimos 10.000 años, más o menos, que es lo que se conoce como Holoceno, que sería la historia más reciente de, del planeta. Lagunas Pampianas. Baja profundidad. 2 metros como máximo. Profundidad en Nahuel Rucá, de 60 a 80 centímetros casi todo el año. Forma. Anillo de vegetación que la circunda y centro con aguas abiertas. Y lo que se observa claramente es un cambio en coloración, desde sedimentos mucho más orgánicos recientes, hacia sedimentos con muy poca cantidad de materia orgánica y de otros tipos. Las lagunas dejan un registro. Digamos, todo lo que vive en el cuerpo de agua, en algún momento muere, se deposita y con el tiempo se entierra. Eso queda preservado en los sedimentos del fondo de la laguna. Conocer la historia de estos cuerpos de agua, ver cómo ahí ha sido su evolución en el tiempo para ver bueno, cómo pueden ser fluctuaciones a futuro. En las lagunas como Nahuel Rucá se ven periodos alternados de fuertes sequías y grandes inundaciones. Digamos, una pregunta que nos podemos hacer es si eso fue, es en cierto modo natural o si es una consecuencia de los cambios que hoy en día el hombre está haciendo en estos ambientes. Para entender cómo fueron estas lagunas en el pasado, primero hay que saber cómo son ahora. Una vez que tenemos más o menos estudiado ese patrón moderno de lo que está pasando con la flora y fauna actual, después vemos cómo eso se deposita cuando todo muere. Porque, digamos, todo lo que tenemos vivo en la laguna no necesariamente es lo que después queda depositado abajo. Digamos, yo puedo encontrar, por ejemplo, un caracol en un sedimento. Y yo sé que por la especie de caracol, por lo que estoy estudiando hoy en día, vive con determinada especie de otro invertebrado de partes blandas que nunca lo voy a encontrar fósil. Pero yo sé que está, aunque yo no lo encuentre. Las lagunas tienen diferentes zonas y distintos tipos de muestras. Por eso los biólogos cuentan con una gran variedad de instrumentos. Esto es lo que en inglés se denomina gravity core, en realidad es un perforador por gravedad. Básicamente lo que hacemos es arrojarlo una vez que estamos en el cuerpo de agua en la laguna, preferentemente en la parte más profunda, y lo que sucede es que se hinca en el sedimento y tiene una válvula que lo que provoca es un vacío en el, en el tubo y evita que el sedimento se caiga cuando nosotros recuperamos. Como este perforador es un instrumento muy caro, Diego fabricó un modelo casero más económico y tan eficiente como los importados. Tiene bueno, una válvula eh, de no retorno, que se usa en sanitarios, agarraderas, eh, un tubo de acrílico que se consigue en casas de acrílico y no mucho más, un poco de ingenio. <risa> Con este instrumento se puede observar con claridad la interfase entre el agua y el sedimento. Bueno, lo que resta ahora es sacar el tubo transparente y gracias al tapón y un caño extraer todo este sedimento hacia la punta y sacar muestras cada un centímetro o medio centímetro para analizar los cambios a, en, en vegetación, en diatomeas, etc. Hoy eh, las chicas, por ejemplo, estuvieron mostrando en la zona litoral de los juncos con distintos implementos. Un copo, que es una red unida a un palo, en el cual lo que hace con el copo es tratar de mostrar 
todos los organismos que están vivos en la zona donde hay mucha vegetación, digamos, pegados a todos esos juncales que se ven. Bueno, encontré una... Ah, ¿qué encontraste? Una pomacea. Muerta, ¿no? No. Mirá, tiene el opérculo. Ah, mira. Y bastante grande, parece un adulto. Atardece y la jornada de trabajo en la laguna Nahuel Rucá llega a su fin. Todas las muestras de plantas, animales, agua y sedimento viajan a un laboratorio para ser analizadas. Primero teníamos unos resultados bastante seguros, pero a la vista de otros nuevos resultados estamos dudando, o sea que hay que seguir perforando lagunas para llegar a, este, a tener un número representativo para poder hablar de una historia regional de estos cuerpos de agua. Hoy en Científicos e Industria Argentina vamos a tener un privilegio particular, algo que sucede pocas veces en la vida, la oportunidad de encontrarnos con una mujer única. No significa que sea la mejor, es única en lo que hizo, es única en lo que hace. Se llama Jane Goodall. Nos visita hoy Jane Goodall, primatóloga británica, doctora en etología por la Universidad de Cambridge, 1965. Estudió el comportamiento de los chimpancés en el Parque Nacional Gombe, Tanzania. Fundó el Jane Goodall Institute para el estudio y protección de los chimpancés y sus hábitats. La ONU la nombró Embajadora de la Paz. Tiene más de 35 doctorados honoris causa de universidades e instituciones de todo el mundo. I just introduce you as a woman who is unique. I wouldn't say that you are the best, but certainly you've been unique. Because of... Excuse me? We're all unique. That is very true, but not everybody is in the public eye and have done so many different things as you have and have started uh, to walk on roads that were not there. So that makes someone unique, don't you think? Uh, when you look back now, how do you look at your career or what you've done? How old were you when you started? It depends which point you take as the starting point. You make the call. Well, when I was 10 years old, I decided I would grow up, go to Africa, live with animals and write books about them. I didn't want to be a scientist. Uh, I just wanted to be out. I wanted to be a naturalist. That's how it began. And believe it or not, it began when I found a book about Tarzan. So. It was triggered by, by Tarzan and Dr. Doolittle mm -hmm. and a very special book which I actually I think this book has a lot to do with who I am. It, it was called The Miracle of Life. Uh -huh. It was a, quite a big book. Uh, it was, a, I can't remember, publication date, 1920, something like that. Uh -huh. Black and white pictures. I don't think there were color pictures back mm -hmm. then. It was not for children. It had it went right through the history of science. It went through the different, um, you know, kinds of animals, starting with amoeba and working the way up. It had prehistory. It had the history of medicine, the discovery of the circulation. It, it really had everything in it. And that was like my Bible when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And I spent hours poring over it. And I, I just think that gave me a really good basically scientific grounding. Actually, I'm wrong. You're wrong? If you really want the start of my scientific career, yes. we go back again. We go back to age five. Okay. When I had this huge joy of going to have a holiday in the country, because uh -huh. we lived in London. Uh -huh. And for an animal-loving little girl, you know, London, well, there's pigeons and we had a dog, but otherwise, you know. Uh -huh. So there I was in the country, cows, pigs, horses, close up. Uh -huh. I remember it vividly, and I was given a job to help collect the hen's eggs. And in those days, there were no cruel battery farms. The hens were around in the farmyard and you know, sometimes laid their eggs off in the vegetation, but mostly in these little wooden hen houses mm -hmm. where they also slept at night. So I would go around with my basket and 
open up the lids of the nest boxes and if there was an egg, pop it in the basket. Well, you know, that, that's an egg roughly. Uh -huh. Where did the egg come out of the hen? Apparently I was asking everybody, but where does the egg come out? Nobody told me. So I distinctly remember seeing a hen climbing up into her hen house and thinking, oh, she's going to lay an egg, crawling after her, big mistake. Squawks of fear, she flew out. Right, 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 right. right. I remember thinking, this is now a frightening place for hen. So I left it. Now I'm on the, you know, I'm going to find out. So I go into an empty hen house and hid in the straw and I waited and waited and waited. Now the family had no idea where I was. Uh -huh. Finally my mother sees this excited little girl all covered in straw. Instead of getting mad at me, how dare you go off without telling us, don't you dare do it again. She saw my shining eyes and sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. So if you look at that story now, isn't that the makings of a little scientist? The curiosity, asking questions, not getting the answer, deciding you have to find out for yourself, doing it wrong, not giving up, and learning patience. Mm -hmm. How many days in a row have you spent without speaking a word with a human being? Well, that would be the first year of my chimp study, and it was every day for about a year. That was in the evening, I would get back to the camp and there'd be my, my Tanzanian cook. So we spoke a little in the evening, but all day, every day, was just me out in the forest. If I were to live a year doing something, probably I would remember what happened last week, yesterday, the day before, but I don't know if I would recall day by day, hour by hour. Did you write? Oh, I wrote. You wrote? Every evening, journal. Journal. Absolutely. I mean, you know, by this time I'd met Louis Leakey, and it was he who gave me the opportunity to go and study chimpanzees. His reasoning was, um, because chimpanzees are more like us than any other living creature, then if we found behavior that was common to chimpanzees today and humans today, and if we believe there was a common ancestor about six million years mm -hmm. ago, which I do, mm -hmm. Then he argued, if we find behavior that's uh, similar or identical, that may have come from the common ancestor, and therefore been part of our human heritage since that long ago time. Did you have conjectures? What was your first time that you, saw, you thought, maybe this is happening, but I would need to, having a scientific approach, you need to confirm and many, many times over and over until you say, this is a pattern. These people have joy, sorrow, they hug, they kiss, they do the same things that we do. When was that? That took a long time because the biggest problem was for at least the first three or four months, they all ran away. They're very conservative. They'd never seen a white ape before mm -hmm. and they would vanish into the forest. But eventually one male, one adult male, whom I named David Greybeard, because he had a beautiful white beard. Uh -huh. He began to lose his fear. And he actually came into my camp and found some bananas that were there for me and took them. And after a while, you know, my cook said, well, you, he suggested I stay down because David was actually coming to feed on palm nuts. And so I stayed down. I usually went up every, I mean, it was, you know, every morning, half past, half past five alarm clock, up the hills, back by seven, and that was my day, uh -huh. always. But, okay, I stayed down to see this chimpanzee who apparently was visiting. So really, he helped me open a door into this magic world, the world of the wild chimpanzees. And wasn't I lucky to be the first Westerner to explore that world in depth? Okay, now talking about personalities, when did you start because it's difficult to recognize different personalities among human beings. I mean, because we tend to categorize, to put labels, this one is this. How did you find out that with, with the chimpanzees? Well, it took time, and some took much longer than others, but um, they did begin coming to my camp for bananas, so that brought them together. It was probably a mistake, but it happened, and it wasn't planned, it just happened. And so I got to know the personalities 
with all their little idiosyncrasies much quicker than I would have out in the forest. And probably, if that hadn't happened, I might never have got the money to continue. I mean, I had no degree at the time. And if I was failing to see something exciting, you know, who would go on giving money? I had money for six months from a rich American businessman. Uh -huh. And then fortunately, just before that money ran out, I saw David Greybeard again using a piece of grass as a tool, picking a leafy twig and stripping the leaves. And, you know, it was that observation that did it, because at that time it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. When did you start naming them? The moment I recognized one, he or she had a name. Jane, when you are like here in Buenos Aires, in a zoo, you go where the gorillas or the chimpanzees or whatever the apes are, when you see them, you see, you see them all differently? Oh yes, they, 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 they definitely all look different. And funnily enough, you know, there's always a resemblance to one of the chimpanzees I knew so well. You, your mind kind of searches for familiarity, I think. And so, oh yes, this one looks a little bit like David or, you know. It happens everywhere you go. Um, yes, except, well, some chimpanzees are very, very, very distinct. And you don't, they don't remind you of anyone, but. Vamos a hacer una pausa, we'll do a break here. Vamos a hacer una pausa aquí en Científicos Industria Argentina e inmediatamente después volvemos con una de las personalidades más importantes dentro del de estudio de los chimpancés salvajes, alguien que le dedicó la vida a un punto particular específico, Jane Goodall. Enseguida volvemos. Grupo Petersen, desde 1920, construyendo el país. Descubrimiento e innovación en las cosas de todos los días. Alimentos saludables. Cocinas y hornos solares. Hormonas de crecimiento. Planes de prevención de adicciones. Tecnología para satélites y para viviendas económicas. Cultivos resistentes. Nuevas fuentes de energía renovables. Medicamentos y terapias contra diabetes, cáncer, chagas. Conicet. Argentinos en las cosas. 